morning. My name is John Kenny, and I welcome you. I'm the senior pastor here. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. Can I just say something? Y'all look well rested. Man, we're so glad. And if you're a Georgia fan, you look even better today, right? So I'm not going to say anything else about football for the rest of this, rest of this message. <laughs> Some of you said thank you. Man, we're really glad to have you guys with us. If you're a guest with us, thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. And uh, man, if you're a first or second time guest, there's a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. It looks like this. And I would love for you to fill that out and let us know that you came today. Just place it in the uh, orange boxes on the way out of worship. I also want to reference something I talked about last week. If you missed it, I hope you'll check it out online on our website. We called last Sunday Imagine More. It was one of those milestone Sundays for our church. We've had them in the life of our church where people make commitments to several things. And man, I'm just so glad uh, that you as a church are willing to do that. Uh, so last week, we filled out these cards that are in the seat pockets in front of you as well. You'll see these. And if you didn't get to fill one out, I'd love for you to fill one out today uh, and place them in one of the offering boxes. The reason we're doing this is we are looking forward to three worship services. We're calling it Three on Three, December 3rd. We're starting a third worship service, and so on Sunday mornings, we will have 9, 10, 30, and 12 noon services going forward. It's not just that day, it's every day after that as well. And that's because we just have seen how our church has grown, and we feel uh, that's just an amazing thing, and we want to create a welcoming home, is what I said last week, for everybody uh, here at Quest. And there's so many more people that need a home who don't have one like you have here at this church. So uh, we're going to start a third service. So we need more people to serve. And so we're asking you to serve on that card. Thank you for those of you who signed up. And uh, we're asking you to give to help pay down the mortgage on these facilities. We still owe money, much like many of us do on our own homes here. This is God's house, and we're still paying for it. But we thank you for your generosity. And again, fill out one of these cards. You can also go online and do that if you didn't have a chance to do it. That's another way that 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 you can do that and take care of that. Um, if you signed up last week or if you serve in any area of our church, we have training on November 15th at 6.30. So a couple Wednesdays from now, child care provided. This is for anybody who serves in any capacity on Sunday morning. If you haven't served on Sunday morning and you filled one of these out, we need you there. If you're a veteran and as I'm speaking, you're like, I don't need to come to that. Um, and you think you know everything about your area. You probably do and could teach us some things, right? But we need you to come and help with our other new folks. And in addition to that, because we're going to three services, the timing between the services is different. Some things are changing a little bit. We need your help and we need you to be here. But you know the biggest reason you need to come? Our Ignite student band is playing that night and leading us in worship. So yes, come on, give, they're in the room. Let's uh, get a little excited about that. You haven't heard them play before, probably, and you're going to get to hear them that night. So uh, we would love, love, love to have you at this training. I'll remind you about it again next week. All right, so you're here today for our closing week of a series called Vertical, where what we've been doing is talking about how to, I call it, cultivate a prayer life, like how, how to create a prayer life. And the first Sunday of this series, I admitted, I confessed that if there's anything I struggle with in my spiritual disciplines, prayer is the biggest thing. And I thought there were others in the room, were there, that struggle with prayer? <laughs> like you don't do it, you do it seldom, you fall asleep when you're doing it, you forgot what you were doing. Yeah, see, a lot of us struggle with prayer. It is a difficult thing. So I, I said from the beginning that prayer is tough, but it's it's talking to God, it's listening to God, it's having a conversation with God. And we've been looking at various things throughout this series, and we're going to wrap it up today. But I want to go in a difficult direction today with this, because I think many of us um, have been where I'm about to say, or will be there again. And so the question I want to ask this morning is this, how do I pray when I'm in the middle of it? Y'all know what it is, right? <laughs> You're in the middle of it. Like something's not going right in your life. And you walked in here and you're like, I, it's funny, I've been saying to several people as I've been greeting them this morning, I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm talking about that today. 
Because I know, like me, sometimes you get in the middle of it, and you're just struggling. You're, you're suffering. You're struggling. You, you go through periods of uh, depression or something like that. You feel alone. Um, even in the church community, you can feel that way. So how do you pray when you're in the middle of it? Because when you're in the middle of it, it seems like God is distant, right? Sometimes it feels like he's not there at all. It feels like your prayers are going nowhere. It's like they go up and then they bounce off the ceiling and you're like, I don't even think anybody's listening to me. It feels like you're alone, like no one understands. And again, sometimes you're in the midst of community, but it does not matter. You look at people and they look happy and you're like, I'm not happy, but I'll play the church face thing that we talk about here and I'll smile, but I'm not happy. And it just feels fake, right? And you feel like you're faking your spiritual life. It can even feel like this, that God is against you. You might think, God is against me. He's out to get me. This is punishment for something I've done in my life. So if you're in the middle of it today, like because of the things I just mentioned, it could be relational, spiritual, emotional, a number of things. It might just be a personal thing. It might be a sin or something else in your life. I don't know. But if you're in the middle of it and there's some kind of thing that's even out of your control, a lot of times it's that, that we don't even cause it. It's caused by an external thing, external person or something like that. If you're in the middle of it, then this message is for you. If you're not in the middle of it, guess what? This message is for you because you know what? You might wake up tomorrow because there's no guarantee. We know this, right? And you might be in the middle of it. You might get the word from the doctor or you might have something go wrong in a relationship or some tragedy could strike you that you didn't expect or something could go wrong financially. There's just a number of things that can happen. You could just wake up and you just don't feel right and feel good about life and it stays with you for a long... I mean, for various reasons we end up in the middle of it. And so if you're not in the middle of it today, you could be tomorrow. Now, a word to you if you're not a Christian, not a church person. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being with us today. And I know that you end up in the middle of it too, just like Christians do. And so I think there's some good things you can learn from this today. And I'd, I'd encourage you to try what I'm talking about today. Even if you're not a Christian, try this. And, and just, I don't know, see, see what happens if you try this. But if you are a Christian... I really encourage you to do what we're talking about today. So as I thought about this message this week, I must be honest with you that I didn't start with Scripture. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. By that, I didn't go to the Bible and look at what I wanted to talk about, and then from that, have something come from it. I actually asked this question and wrote it down, and then I was like, well, I wonder if Scripture has anything to say about this. Is that bad? But that's life, right? <laughs> Sometimes you, you're not thinking about anything that God would say to you or something like that. You're just in the middle of it, and then you're trying to figure it out. Y'all with me? And so that's kind of what was going on with me this week as I thought about me being in the middle of it in some ways, and you're in the middle of it in other ways. And so how do we pray, since this is the topic of our series, when we're in the middle of it? And as I asked this question... I actually very quickly thought of two people in the story of the Bible that I want to look at today and see what they can say to us, because they both were in the middle of it in different ways, and so if you're in the middle of it today, or you think you might be, or you just need a tool for when it comes later, I pray that you can learn something from these two today. The first person I want to look at uh, is a man named Job. Have you heard of him? Even if you haven't been in church, you may have heard of him because somebody says, man, they're like Job right now. And you're like, that just don't sound good. <laughs> and it's because Job suffered greatly in the Bible. Well, let me give you a little bit of Job's background before he got in the middle of it. Job actually was known as the godliest man in the world. How would you like that for you know, your nomenclature? You're, that's what you're known for, being a very godly man person. So Job was a very moral man, a very upright man. You would want to be friends with Job. And so Job, not only that, he, he, was, uh, he had so much that we would call blessing. Like he had a big family, lots of children, uh, a loving wife. He had lots of money. <laughs> 
Anybody in the room would, no, nah, I don't need any of that. I mean, he, you know, he had lots of money. He had health. He had all kinds of things. But then he lost all of that. Tragedy struck him, and when it did, he lost all of his wealth. He actually lost all of his family. His children died. His wife thinks he's crazy for still believing in God after that and curses him and leaves him. And Job ends up also losing his health. And at the point of the story we're going to be looking at today, Job is sitting in the middle of a street. I want you to imagine as you drive home in your cul-de-sac or down the, the street of your neighborhood today, you see a person sitting in the street, this was Job, in, he's in sackcloth, like a burlap bag, think of a big potato sack race, and that's what he's wearing, and he's pouring ashes over his head because that was a sign of brokenness and suffering and like, God, help me. That's what they did. And so you drive home, you see that. What would you think? You'd drive around him, wouldn't you? And you'd be like, man, poor guy. <laughs> Got to get the roast out of the oven, right? We'd go on with our lives, most of us. But sometimes that's where people are. And so that's where Job was. And Job had friends that came to him. And actually, at first, they were like really good friends because they sat with him. They didn't say anything. That's a good word. I don't have time to talk about that today, but they said nothing. Sometimes your presence is the best thing you can give somebody. Just keep your mouth shut. Amen? Man, we open up our mouths and we start giving theology to people in a situation or something like that. And all they need right then is what? Our presence. I'm with you. I'm here. After a week, they open up their mouths and they start going, Job, what'd you do, man? Like you had to do something because you need to know in the Old Testament, in, in that old covenant theology in Job's day and time, there was this belief that if you suffered, it was because you did something wrong. And so God was punishing you. Jesus spoke against that constantly in the New Testament. Like y'all messed this up, theology up. That's not why a person's suffering. But his friends said, man, what'd you do? And so they finally end up leaving. He has another friend that comes and tries to talk. And, but in the end, it's kind of just Job and God. And Job hasn't really said a word, but finally, 30-something chapters in Job, he speaks up and says something. And you tell me if he's in the middle of it. This is his prayer to God. Job chapter 30, I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. You have become cruel toward me. He's talking to God. You use your power to persecute me. You throw me into the whirlwind and destroy me in the storm. And I know you are sending me to my death, the destination of all who live. Surely no one would turn against the needy when they cry for help in their trouble. Did I not weep for those in trouble? Then he's talking about what he's done for others. Was I not deeply grieved for the needy? So I looked for good, but evil came instead. I waited for the light, but darkness fell. My heart is troubled and restless. Days of suffering torment me. I walk in gloom without sunlight. I stand in the public square and cry for help. Instead, I am considered a brother to jackals and a companion to owls. I don't know what that means, but it just sounds bad. Doesn't it? Basically saying, nobody understands. People think I'm nuts. My skin has turned dark and my bones burn with fever. My harp plays sad music and my flute accompanies those who weep. This is in the story of the Bible. This is actually the book of Job is considered wisdom literature. There's certain genres of literature and scripture and this is considered wisdom. All right, so wisdom being a smart way to live. But Job here is crying out to God. Would you say he's in the middle of it? Who thinks he's in the middle of it? Come on, man, participate with me. I'm I know you've, you're well rested, but he's in the middle of it. Amen? Amen just means yes, I agree, preaching. He's in the middle of it. And what I need you to remember is he was a follower of God and still is a follower of God at this point. And that's important to know because sometimes we think, oh, followers of God, followers of Jesus, man, everything's perfect. We have this wrong theology, health, wealth, and prosperity, and all this, like nothing can go wrong. Read the Bible. <laughs> sometimes bad things happen 
to good and godly people. It's right here. And Job cries out. All right, I'm going to leave him for a minute. We're going to come back, but I just, he's in the middle of it, right? Y'all with me? Let's go to the other person I wanted to look at. It's actually Jesus. Jesus ends up in the middle of it as well. Um, let me set this up for you. We're going to be looking at the end of his life. Jesus has spent three years in ministry. He's called 12 followers or disciples, and many others are following him now as well, but it's kind of a just barely knit together type of thing, and people are leaving him left and right, and it's just before Jesus dies, and he's gathered together with his disciples for what we now term the Last Supper, because it was the last time he ate with them, and we get our act of communion from this, which we'll have in just a little bit, where Jesus said, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood spilled out for you, and they're thinking, what the heck is he, this is what they're thinking, what is he talking about? We like to over-spiritualize and romanticize scripture. They had no idea what he was talking about. Here we go back to that cannibalism thing Jesus was talking about where they're going to eat my body and drink my blood. And people left him after that because they're like, this is too weird. But his disciples stuck with him and then he has the last supper and he breaks the bread and he gives them the wine. He says, this is my body. This is my blood poured out for you. And they're like, just eat it. We don't know what he's doing. Really, this is what's going on. And Jesus says, I'm going to die. And they're like, no, we're not doing that. One of his disciples has already left him, Judas. And so Jesus is like, the, the 11 of you, we, let's go pray. Because I'm facing my death, and this is, I'm struggling and suffering. And it says in the scripture that they go to pray, and when Jesus is praying, sweat like drops of blood come from his body. I've read that there's an actual medical condition like that, whether it was physical or, or just a spiritual way of saying he was suffering a lot. That's happening to Jesus. He's in great distress, and he's with several of his disciples. Judas is about to return and arrest him. He's about to be put on the cross within hours, but Jesus is praying. It's his greatest hour of need, and he comes back to his disciples, and guess what they're doing? Praying, oh, oh, please be with our leader. I mean, oh, you know what they're doing? Sleeping. I love scripture. I love the Bible. I love the story because it's so me. <laughs> It's like, I abandon Jesus. I fall asleep, I, right? Jesus comes back, and he's like, please stay awake. And then he goes and prays, and this happens three times. But then here's one of his prayers, and it's a lot shorter. I'm going to read just a little section of it than, than Job's. But look at his prayer, and you tell me if he's in the middle of it. He says, he went on a little further, bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, exclamation mark. He's crying out, if it is possible, if there's any way, if there's anything you could do about this, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. He's talking about what's about to happen to him. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be put on a cross. Let this cup of suffering pass from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And so Jesus uses the image of a cup and says, it's like I'm being caused to drink this cup of suffering. If there's any way that I could not have to do that, I'd like to pass that along, Father. This is Jesus talking. I love this because we sometimes only think about the divinity of Jesus, yet there is in this moment the humanity of Jesus, which is much like you and I, where when the cup of suffering comes, what do you say? No. Please no. Please God, no. I don't want this to happen to me when you're in the middle of it. And Jesus is like, I'd, I'd really like to let this pass on. Yet not my will, but yours is the one I want done. Jesus is in the middle of it, right? You see that? Even if you, we all love Jesus, I think, but even if you, you know, no, he was God, read the story. <laughs> yes, he was God, but he was fully man, fully human, and he suffered, and I love this about Jesus because I can relate. Can't you? He's struggling here. He's in the middle of it. He's facing his death. He's alone. His friends are there, but what are they doing? Sleeping. Sometimes you feel like your friends are sleeping when you're in the middle of it. Now, in both cases, I notice something. So again, I read these passages this week. I read these stories, and I all right, got Job thousands of years, actually, before Jesus. You got Jesus, so you got an Old Testament, Old Covenant story. You got a New Covenant, New Testament story. And there's something that they have in common. And it's incredible. I was like, whoa, look at that. 
And so if you were to look at their prayers when they're praying, I think you would find that they were honest in their prayers. They talk to God. They're real with God. And so I think one of the points we can take from this when you're in the middle of it is be honest. Pray honestly. Be real. God knows how you feel, right? We, we believe that as Christians. I don't know if you're a Christian or not. I believe that. But God knows what we're thinking. God knows how we feel. He is over us. He understands these things. So when you're in the middle of it, tell him you're in the middle of it and tell him how you feel. Pray honestly. Job prays honestly. So honest that he says, God, you're doing this to me. I mean, nobody understands. My own friends now think that I've done something wrong, and Job knew he'd done nothing. He was righteous and godly and upright and lost it all. And so he's like, why would this happen? Jesus is honest. Jesus is like, God, it's like a cup of suffering has come to me. Father, and if there's any way, I'd like to pass that along. The word for uh, where Jesus says, Father, God here in his prayer is the word Abba, which means daddy in our language. I love the word daddy because my kids call me that. It feels intimate and like we have a good relationship. And that's how it was with Jesus and his father. So in the intimacy of that relationship, he's like, now I want you to imagine as a parent, maybe this will make it more real. If you had a child who said, please don't let this happen to me, what would you do as their father or mother? You would snatch them out of that in half a second, wouldn't you? Because you don't want your children to suffer like that. Yet God's hand doesn't move to snatch Jesus out. So he's struggling, but he's honest. So when you're in the middle of it, pray honestly. Job did. Jesus did. I think there's a couple things that, if um, think about this. We have a tendency to do one of two things we're in the middle of it when, it when it comes to prayer. One is to pray fake prayers, religious prayers. Dear God, thank you for this suffering. And I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it. I guess I am a little. But I think sometimes we put on church face and act religious. And you know what happens when the world looks at that? They're like, yeah, I can't do that. Whatever you feel, pray. God wants to hear it. Job did. Jesus did. So we either get fake and religious. We don't believe it anyway, but we pray it. Or we don't pray at all. Because we don't think we can be honest with God. Many of us, I was thinking about that this week, many of us, many of you don't pray. The reason you don't pray is because you don't think you can actually be honest with God. You've seen far too many religious prayers. You've watched leaders like myself maybe even praying, and you're like, I, 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 don't, you know, I don't have that kind of relationship with God. I can't be. You're like, I just got to talk to him. Can I do that? Yes. Forgive me if I've ever not said that. Yes. But many of us don't pray because we don't think we can be honest with God. What would it look like if the God of the universe you could be honest with in your prayers? Would you want to pray? Would you want to talk to him about stuff that's going on? Of course you would. So think about that. Very often, we have a tendency in the middle of it to pray fake religious prayers or not pray at all. So when you're in the middle of it, pray honestly. But there's, there's one difference I noticed. You probably saw it. In these two honest prayers, some of you just kept going forward, but you, some of us, some of us church people, we like cannot deal with the humanity of Jesus, <laughs> right? Think about it. you just want, but look what he said at the end: "Not my will, your will be done." Like that was it was easy. He was sweating drops of blood, friends. His friends were asleep. He was anguished, sweating, weeping, suffering, but. He did focus his attention not on the situation, but on his father, God. Job's focus, think about this. The difference in the two honest prayers is they had different focuses. Job's and Jesus's. Job's was focused entirely on the situation, wasn't it? It's all he could see. And God became so distant to him, and even a God who would hurt Job intentionally. Jesus prays an honest prayer, but 
he sees his situation, but he looks beyond it as well. That's why it says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. It's not that Jesus isn't suffering. It's not that he doesn't notice his suffering. It's not that the situation's not there. But when the cup of suffering comes, Jesus looks beyond it. So if this cup here were to represent you and this water represented suffering, I don't know how much you'd have. Some of you feel like you're kind of half full with suffering and struggle right now. Others of you, tell me when to stop. Nobody's saying anything. All right. I know. This is how some of us feel today. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. I was was grabbing my coffee this morning at Starbucks like I do, and I tell them to leave me a little room for cream, and so they do, and then I fill it up to the very top like this, and I always have this dilemma on my hands, like, how do I get back to my seat? You know, you can drink some of it, but let's imagine it's suffering. Do you want to drink it? Mm Mm-mm. And what's interesting is, follow me, Job, this is Job, all he can see is the cup of suffering, and that's all he looks at, and he's trying to move, but what happens when you're trying to move with a cup of suffering, right? You look at the cup of suffering, and it spills, doesn't it? When, it it's really weird. It's this, strange, whoop, it's this strange phenomenon that when you look at the cup that's full, seriously, cup of coffee, cup of wine, cup of water, whatever it is, you tend to spill it because it's weird. You're like, you're like oh, 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 see, and you have to stop. Somebody told me once, stop looking at the cup. Look up when you're walking. It had nothing to do with spiritual application. So I tried it, and I was like, huh. So now I can get back to my seat with my coffee, which is good. But I think that's what Jesus was doing. If this is the cup of suffering... It's not that he's ignoring it. It's not that you can ignore yours. You hold it, right? It's there. But if all you do is look at it, and that was Job's prayer, it's all he did was see it. He couldn't see past it. He couldn't look up at God. He was praying. He was honest. But all he saw was this. And God wants us to be honest, but he also wants us to look up and see him and believe that he's with us. And here's the application, I think. You have to keep walking in life, don't you? You can't stay where you are. You can't stay stuck there. You got a life to live. And sometimes in your suffering, you're like, I'm done. You're not done. If you're breathing, you're not done. Amen? So you have to look up at God. And I think what Jesus did was, yet I want your will. He looked up. He saw his suffering. And he looked up at God and he kept walking. That's what we're called to do, my friends. And when you're praying, where you focus matters. Pray honestly, yes. But also focus less on the situation. And I'm not saying you're not suffering. I know it hurts. But you look up and you look at God who will help you walk in the situation. When I'm praying, where I focus matters. Jesus did that, and because of that, he was able to go to the cross and endure it so that you and I could find him, so that we'd know we were loved. Don't, aren't you glad Jesus didn't focus only on his cup of suffering and stop there that night in the garden called Gethsemane? Aren't you glad that Jesus looked up at his father, Abba, Father, intimate relationship, and though he suffered, he kept walking, and the next day he had a cross on his back, and he kept walking, and he kept walking all the way to the hill called Golgotha, and on that hill where he died, he gave his life so that you and I would know. His cup was full, but he kept walking. He drank that cup of suffering. Job gets there. That's what you, you need to know that about Job. All right, Job prays to God. You saw his prayer, right? Two screens full. <laughs> and he prays a lot more. And God answers Job, actually. God does, he talks to Job. That's good. God talks to Job, and Job hears God. And 
you're not going to like this, but can I sum up the book of Job for you? I'd still encourage you to read it, but if you don't want to read it, here's the book of Job. You ready? You're not going to like it. I'm God, you're not. That's the whole book of Job. That's God's answer. Job, I'm going to answer you. I'm God, you're not. You don't see it all. You don't know it all. And I know you're suffering, but I'm with you. I'm talking to you right now. And I love, there's a beautiful verse at the end of the book of Job. Job chapter 42, verse 5. Look at what Job says. I had only heard about you before, prior to the suffering. Stay with me. When life was grand, when everything was perfect, I'd only heard about you. I thought I knew you, but I'd only heard about you. It was like you were somebody in a book, but I didn't know you. But look at what it says. But now I have seen you with my own eyes. Y'all hear Job's theology? Job is saying... It is through my suffering. It is through the tears that flow that I see you now. You want to see God? Look up. I know this is big. I know this. I look around the room and I see situations and I even go, man, I I don't know. Because some of you right now, it's like, I'm all, you know, I can't walk with that much suffering. Jesus did. You're like, well, he was Jesus. I can't do what he did. Yes, you can. You are a follower of Jesus. You go with Jesus. You do what Jesus did. He even said, you can do what I do. You'll do greater things. Why would he ask us to follow him if we can't follow him? You can So whatever your cup of suffering is today, if there's one thing I could ask you to do, it would be to look at God. I know the cup of suffering is there, but look at Jesus and walk so that you can say, I've seen God, so that you can sing that old hymn, it is well with my soul. The guy who wrote that hymn lost his family. And when he was near the place where he lost his family, he wrote the song that we call, It Is Well. I want to pray for us. If there's one thing I could ask you to do all across this room, it would be to pray, to talk to God, to be honest with God. And in your honesty, look at him. I know you're suffering. I know you're struggling. But look at him and walk. Let's pray.